Lord, I pray that you would guide us and direct us today, Lord. But more than anything, Lord, I, I, would we just walk in and enjoy presence with you, Lord? Uh, I think of Mary and Martha when they when you gathered at their house and Mary just sat down and she listened to the words of Jesus. She spent time with Jesus. May, in a way, that be our time here today. May we just sit and enjoy time with you. And may you teach us uh, through your word. So bless this time. Open our minds so we can understand the scriptures. May the Spirit speak to each person what they need to hear. And may no one get out of here without hearing your voice today, Lord God. Oh, how we need it. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in a series called The Words We Speak. Last week we started this series. We talked about the number of words coming out of your mouth a day. And the majority of you are putting together a book, speaking a a, a book 50 pages filled with words in a single day. Think about that just for a moment, that you are publishing books every every single day and people are hearing what you're saying And as we learned last week, that your mouth is directly connected with your heart. And so what comes out of your mouth is really just revealing what's in your heart. So it's significant for us and for other people. Uh, The scripture verse for the series, if you want to memorize this verse, I think it'd be worth memorizing. Proverbs 18, 20 through 21 says, A man or woman's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. And from the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. Now let's stop for just a quick moment because what this is saying, what the proverb is saying is that what you speak, you will eat. And so if you're speaking negative words, critical words, everything is just horrible in life, I got no hope for the future, you're gonna eat that. You're gonna get filled up with that. Or if you choose to say, hey, I I wanna start to speak a new word. I wanna start to put a new book out there. You will live by the produce of your lips. And then the final phrase, which is significant, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life. What you speak, you have the power to bring about devastation and death in your life and in others or you have the power to speak life into people with your tongue. And last week we, we started, actually we opened the book to James, the book of James, and we learned, uh, the title of last week was Managing Your Mouth. Uh, can we manage, can we learn to manage our mouth? We talked about the power of the tongue. As James does, he gives six metaphors explaining how powerful the tongue is. And one of those metaphors, uh, he talks about the rudder of a ship, And he talks about this big ship and how the rudder can control the course of the ship and your tongue can control the course of your life and the life of other people around you. By the words that you speak, you can literally reshape the course, create a new course into the lives of others. It has the power to direct. It also has the power to destroy. James talks about a fire. I was driving on uh, West Avon Road just a couple days ago, and there was a fire, and it destroyed the insides of a house. The, the outside of the house was still standing. It was right by uh, Avon Middle School, if you want to take a look uh, just before uh, north of that. But if the, the outsides of the house was still standing. The inside was completely destroyed, and it just reminded me that by our words, you can do destruction to people's lives, the insides, the soul of people, and they may still be standing, they may still be in front of you, but you literally can destroy them, or by your tongue, you have the power to delight people, and oh, that we would be a people that are spending our lives delighting others, amen? Uh, the, the verse, I, I suppose, if we were to pray anything, Colossians 3.17, whatever we do, in word or in deed, Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And we ought to be giving thanks, and we ought to be thinking, hey, that every word that comes off of my tongue, oh, my hope would be that every tongue is, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And if we would all just get on board with living that way, 
that'll be wonderful both for us, uh, glorious for us and for other people. So today as we continue this series talking about words, I want to talk to you today about the language of heaven. Uh, Just think for a moment right now, in heaven there are people, many of you uh, have loved ones that have gone to heaven. Uh, Some of you maybe are close or to that time, I think all of us uh, in some form or fashion are closer and we don't even know, right? No one knows the day or the hour, but there is conversation going on right now in heaven and people are talking in heaven. Just think about the conversations that they're having up there right now. What are some of the phrases that they're speaking? Uh, what is the tone and the posture of the conversations in heaven, and I just want to suggest today that maybe we would look with a lens to see that if we could control our tongue so that our conversations on earth are the same as the conversations, the words that are spoken in heaven, then we'll bring a little heaven onto earth. Amen? And wouldn't that be great for everyone around us that we would go into the circumstances of life to the places, the businesses, the schools, the relationships, whether it's high school relationships or it's you know, uh, relationships in, in, in the, uh, the long-term nursing home, that, that we're speaking the very words that they're speaking in heaven, and those words are words that are proceeding from the mouth of God and filling the conversations of the people, and that's our desire. And so as we talk about the language of heaven today, uh, what I wanna do just to sort of break the the message up here is, first of all, lay the foundation for heaven on earth, because Jesus said that we can have a little bit of heaven on earth, and then secondly, learn language from heaven that we ought to speak on this earth. So that's what we're gonna do today. I wanna jump in, first of all, to, to build the foundation for heaven on earth. Now Jesus, when he taught us to pray, you probably know this prayer, and maybe you don't always think about the different points of this prayer, but this is what he says in the beginning of the prayer. He says, when you pray, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. And your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus taught us to pray. Jesus believed, uh, assumed, uh, presumed, uh, declared that his kingdom would come on this earth. And our hope and our desire is that God's kingdom would come all the more and that it would literally Uh, take presence and place in the kingdom of this earth, and when that occurs, oh, how blessed we would be. Now, when Jesus taught about the kingdom, his kingdom coming on earth, there was a lot of confusion around because a lot of them were saying, hey, we want to see the kingdom. When are you going to bring about this visible kingdom on this earth? And Jesus, there was actually a time where the Pharisees came to Jesus and they said, when are you going to establish, set up this kingdom on this earth? And Jesus' response to them explained the kingdom. In Luke 17, he says, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Jesus was saying, stop looking for it to come in Rome, or in Washington, because it's already in your midst. And what Jesus was saying is, he said, like, I'm the king, and I'm in your midst, and the kingdom is here. Uh, And when people would choose to submit to the rule and reign of God, to worship him, to know him, the kingdom is present on this earth. Uh, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, but my kingdom's coming into this world. Uh, With those who would submit to the sovereign rule and reign of Jesus, and that's what we're doing here today. In fact, I don't know if you've realized, but in this place here today, we have the local presence of the kingdom of God here in Simsbury, Connecticut. This is God's kingdom right here. And we have come together today to uh, read his word, to pray to him, to, to talk to him, 
to worship him. One day we're going to do it in heaven, in the fullness, but we get a taste of it today here. And that's what we're here to do today is to be the people of God coming together to worship to God and to submit to the rule and reign of God. And just as I was down in the front row and we were singing these songs, um, I just honestly, I was, I I didn't want to miss that long, that law, law, last song. You know, how great the Father's love for us. And I kind of just wanted to sit out here, but I, I sort of will scoot out and sort of just look over my notes and make sure I'm ready to go. But I was just like, I just want to be reminded of God's love for every one of us. Like, he loves you. And and, and he declared his love for you when he died on the cross. Uh, How many of you know that what you really love, you will suffer for? In fact, we can tell what you love by just looking at what you're willing to suffer for. Parents in the room, most of you, (laughs) on most days, maybe not every day, will suffer for your kids. Some of you will go without sleep. Some of you will go without um, certain things that you would like to buy so that you can provide for your kids. Jesus suffered for you. The nails in his hand And the nails in his feet tell us how much he loves you, how much he loves us. And and I just wanted to sit out there and just just, just be like, I just want to be caught up in this story again and be reminded how much God loves me. And, and, And we're called as a church to come together, not just here on Sundays, but throughout the week. That's why we gather in groups. That's why we gather with one another and we pray for one another and we talk on a smaller level because we can't talk here about all the th- different things we can talk about there when we're in this small group. And, we, you know, I call people, I call uh, someone on the phone every, most Monday mornings and we just say, hey, what's our goals for them? What's our struggles? And let's pray for one another. Like, it's the kingdom of God here in this place. And our hope and our prayer is that it will grow, that the kingdom will get bigger so that we can say, yes, we have a church of 300 people. No, it's not about the size of what we want. It's about God's kingdom coming in this time, in this place. And we were in Texas a few weeks ago, and we were worshiping at a church, and we're just going around the community, and it just seems like there's more. Like Janet was just saying, man, it just seems like there's more of God's kingdom, more Christians in this place, and how amazing is it? And we went to a Christian college, actually Liberty, the place that we went to school, and we were just like, this is so amazing to be in a place where there's people that are gathering together and they worship God and they believe in what he says, they trust his words. And the kingdom, Jesus said, we gotta pray that it would come in our time, in our place. And so we gather together and then we scatter. We gather, gather, and then we scatter. And the hope is you scatter is that you would go and be the presence of God's kingdom into the homes where you lay hardwood floors or into uh, the medical facilities where you work robots that operate on people or into wherever it is. Some of you, it's at home working you know, on your computer and, you, and, and you're, 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 you're working that, but that you would be the local presence of the kingdom of God. But here's my question for us today. By the way, schools, students, uh, as you go into your stu- schools, does your language reveal and represent what is being spoken in heaven, or does it, as this question here, does our language reflect the heavenly citizens, that of heavenly citizens, or are we speaking the language of earthly citizens? Uh, Earthly citizens, we know. I mean, complaining and mocking and self-serving and struggling with confidence and... I mean, today, if you go onto Twitter, I, I, it's just harsh language for the most part, right? And as we go about, are we speaking the language of heaven? Are we living as citizens of heaven? Now, Graham Kendrick, 
Uh, he says it this way, I appreciate it. He said, we have all grown up speaking the language of earth. Jesus came to teach us the language of heaven. The church should be, in a sense, a foreign language center. Our language should stand in such contrast to the world that when we come together, it's kind of like, whoa, this is almost like a different language here. Like I don't hear the complaining. I don't hear the put downs or the slander or the trying to one up one another, right? I see people that have problems that they've encountered with one another. Maybe they've misunderstood each other and they're working to find unity and the bond of peace in the midst of that, right? Like it should literally, given the language today, look like a foreign language center. I, I, I am really trying personally to be involved in our community. I, I'm currently coaching a, a 14-year-old girl lacrosse team, and I've never played lacrosse, male or female, and certainly never played female lacrosse, but I've been learning a little bit about it. And it's just shocking to me as I you know, did that, and then this, this past winter I was uh, uh, worked with the National Ski Patrol as a mountain host over at sundown because my kids wanted to ski, and I was like, all right, I'll hang out with you, and I'll go ski. And, and so I'm spending lots of time with people in different places that are not in the church, and it shocks me over and over again, the language, that the, the, the profanity, the vulgarity, the, the, the themes of the discussion... It's just shocking. And so as a church, are we speaking the language of the earth or are we speaking the language of heaven? And uh, let me just build on this for a minute because if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. You are a new citizen. You're no longer primarily American. And I don't want to create any issues here with that today, okay? I know, it's, uh, be proud proud to be an American, but we are citizens of heaven with a secondary dual citizenship, right? And uh, you are no longer in Adam, the first human who uh, proliferated all sorts of sin. You are in Christ if you've been born again. Uh, you have died to the power of an earthly nature and been born to the power of a spiritual nature, a spiritual nature. That means you have the spirit of God living in you. The same creative and promising word that is in God's mouth is also in your mouth. And so you're able to, as you go about the world, uh, just as God spoke and created things in the world, there's a sense that you have the spirit of God in you, that you can go into relationships and you can speak life into people. You can create new futures in people's lives. That's the power that you have, not because of your natural self, but because of the spirit that is in you. Uh, you can't be ordinary if you're in Christ, or you're not supposed to be ordinary, you should be extraordinary because the Spirit of God is in you. And so while the world may be going through some really difficult things in their life, and they look at it in a certain way, and there's words coming out of their mouth that are just reflecting what's going on in their hearts, in, in Christ, you have a spirit in you, and you have the ability to extraordinarily see situations and relationships differently. I don't know if you've ever considered this, but uh, in the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, that was a visitation culture. God visited his people, but the New Covenant is a habitation culture. You have God inside of you. You are in Christ and Christ is in you and the spirit of God is in you and actually Jesus said, I have so many things I wanna say to you but you can't handle them now so I'm sending the spirit of truth and he will speak to you the very words that I want to speak to you or that I have to say to you. And so in Christ, you have the mind of Christ. You have the words of 
Christ. And as you go about this world, as God inhabits you, God is living in you, which means that the Spirit of Jesus will speak the very words of God out of you, which means that much of the world should be attracted to you just as they were attracted to Jesus, which means that your language will probably be like nothing the world has ever heard before if you let the Spirit speak out of you. And so let me just ask the question, what are your words saying about you? Are you speaking the language of heaven Are you speaking as a heavenly citizen or as uh, an earthly citizen? And so Jesus said, pray that the kingdom would come. Why, how will the kingdom come? The kingdom will come in one way, by you speaking the words of the kingdom of God as you go throughout life. And this should be our hope and this should be our prayer. So let's just sort of try to get specific on this. Here's what I wanna do, I wanna give you two phrases that I believe are being spoken in heaven consistently and that were spoken on earth when Jesus was here and I think they should be spoken in our lives all the time. And I believe that if you were to speak these two phrases that you would stand out in this world. You would be the presence of God in this world. And there's hundreds of phrases that are being spoken of heaven that we should speak, but I just thought I would just try to do these two today. And then next week we're gonna come back and we're going to, I'm gonna teach next week on the most powerful words that you can speak. The most powerful words. And we're just gonna get all good at speaking those powerful words. But let's just start with today. Uh, the first phrase that I think is being spoken in heaven that was sp- spoken on earth is this, peace be with you. Peace be with you. There's a phrase that Jesus spoke to the disciple, disciples. This represents the posture of your heart towards other people. And it is a wonderful thing. And oh, if the church were to live with this coming off of their tongues and filling their hearts, oh, what a blessing it would be. It would be heaven in the midst of often hellish circumstances on this earth. Let's just learn from the Bible Project a little bit about peace. Listen to this video. Languages, people can talk about peace treaties or times of peace. It means the absence of war. And in the Bible, the word peace can refer to the absence of conflict, but it also points to the presence of something better in its place. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And in the New Testament, the Greek word is erene. The most basic meaning of shalom is complete or whole. The word can refer to a stone that has a perfect whole shape with no cracks. It can also refer to a completed stone wall that has no gaps and no missing bricks. Shalom refers to something that's complex with lots of pieces that's in a state of completeness, wholeness. It's like Job who says his tents are in a state of shalom because he counted his flock and no animals are missing. This is why shalom can refer to a person's well-being. Like when David visited his brothers on the battlefield, he asked about their shalom. The core idea is that life is complex, full of moving parts and relationships and situations. And when any of these is out of alignment or missing, your shalom breaks down. Life is no longer whole. It needs to be restored. In fact, that's the basic meaning of shalom when you use it as a verb. To bring shalom literally means to make complete or restore. So Solomon brings shalom to the unfinished temple when he completes it. Or if your animal accidentally damages your neighbor's field, you shalom them by giving them a complete repayment for their loss. You take what's missing and you restore it to wholeness. The same goes for human relationships. In the book of Proverbs, to reconcile and heal a broken relationship is to bring shalom. And when rival kingdoms make shalom in the Bible, it doesn't just mean they stop fighting, it also means they start working together for each other's benefit. This state of shalom is what Israel's kings were supposed to cultivate, and it rarely happened. So the prophet Isaiah, he looked forward to a future king, a prince of shalom, and his reign would bring shalom with no end. A time when God would make a covenant of shalom with his people and make right all wrongs and heal all that's been broken. 
This is why Jesus' birth in the New Testament was announced as the arrival of Irene. Remember, that's the Greek word for peace. Jesus came to offer his peace to others, like when he said to his followers, my peace I give to you all. The apostles claimed that Jesus made peace between messed up humans and God when he died and rose from the dead. The idea is that he restored to wholeness the broken relationship between humans and their creator. This is why the apostle Paul can say, Jesus himself is our Irene. He was the whole complete human that I am made to be, but have failed to be. And now he gives me his life as a gift. And this means that Jesus' followers are now called to create peace. Paul instructed local churches to keep their unity through the bond of peace, which requires humility and patience and bearing with others in love. Becoming people of peace means participating in the life of Jesus, who reconciled all things in heaven on earth, restoring peace through his death and resurrection. So peace takes a lot of work because it's not just the absence of conflict. True peace requires taking what's broken and restoring it to wholeness, whether it's in our lives, our relationships, or in our world. And that's the rich biblical concept of peace. Love those videos. If you are in Christ, if you're part of God's kingdom, you are called to create peace. It's what Jesus did. And you are the physical representation of Jesus as the church today. Life is complex. There are a lot of cracks and broken pieces in, pe- in people's lives. And that's why we're called to be peacemakers, to be peace creators. And this begins not outside the church, but it begins inside the church. Uh, I think God personally is more concerned about the problems and the sin in the church than he is about the sin outside of the church. If God's church is holy and is living as the holy bride of Christ, then that will have the greatest impact on the sin and the brokenness outside the church. Let me just be clear. I'm not trying to say that God doesn't care about those outside the church. I'm just saying it starts bringing peace on earth starts with God's people at being at peace and at peace with one another. And if you look in the New Testament, what you see over and over again, if you read the letters, is you see broken people that are struggling to be at peace with one another. It was uh, something that in most letters was addressed. In fact, in the pastoral epistles, which is a, a set of three letters, to t- two to Timothy and one to Titus, so it's First and Second Timothy and Titus, those were letters that Paul wrote specifically to church leaders, and he was directing them how to lead the church, how to organize and lead the church. And in these two letters, which I think comprise four 14 total chapters, three books, 14 chapters, Uh, Paul instructs on 14 different occasions about dealing with problems with words, about dealing with conflict and complaining and slandering in the church. In 2 Timothy 2.14, he says to to, uh, Timothy, he says, keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words that's of no value to those who listen. Titus 3, one through two, remind the people to slander no one. Let me just ask you a question. Is there anyone that you've slandered this past week? Is there anybody that you've sort of thought about or talked about in a way that just is not the language of heaven? Maybe you've texted someone about someone else. Second Timothy 2, 16 through 17, avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. He's saying like, do you realize there's some chatter that goes on in people's lives that, that makes you more and more ungodly. It's sort of like the snowball, and it's like I start talking in a certain way, and I start to develop these habits with my speech, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you know what happens? You start running people over, and there's a trail behind you with your words. And this has happened in the church, and it has no place 
in the church. And as the video said, like it takes work because we're broken people. It takes work to maintain the bond, the bond of peace, right? And so we work towards that. Galatians chapter five, the apostle Paul also says, if you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out, or you too will be destroyed. And so as we go about it, it's like, peace be with you. Again, this is the posture of your heart. Man, I, you said some things or did some things that were really hurtful to me. They really broke me. This is the case in marriages as well. But my heart is that you would have peace, that you would have completeness. I know that there's like stones or blocks in the wall that are missing and the wall is sort of fallen down, but my heart is peace for you. I'm gonna pray for that. I'm gonna work towards it. And I'm gonna let God solve it when I've done everything I can and failed at it. And that's very true. Uh, in Romans chapter 12 and 13, the Apostle Paul says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And he's just saying, hey, there will be some relationships where they will not receive your peace. But have you done everything? Have you spoken the language of heaven towards people that they might have peace? And so this is to start in the church and then it's to extend outside the church to the relationships outside the church towards those that mistreat you and malign you. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, 9, he said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Now, if you look at my children, I know my children love it when I talk about them, but it wakes some people up, right? So um, if you look at my children, we'll just talk about Harper because she's not here right now. So let's just talk about her because she can respond, okay? If you look at Harper, she looks kind of like me. Some people have said that. Now, hopefully she didn't get too many of the dominant characteristics, right? Because she's a girl and we want her to look like a girl and she's pretty and she's awesome and stuff, but she looks like me because she's my child. Guess what Jesus says makes you look most like him? Being a peacemaker. Peace be with you. But when you're cutting people down, slandering people, joining into the language of this world, that's destroying people, shaping the course of people's lives. You are not like God. You're like the other father. You know there's two fathers, right? Our heavenly father and the father of lies. How many of you want to look like the father of lies? Jesus is saying be peacemakers. Like as you go about this world, make peace with people. Make peace with people, because that's what's being spoken in heaven right now. I don't know exactly what's being said in heaven right now, but I don't think I'm actually confident they're not in heaven right now complaining with one another about how long the worship service is. And I know some of you, you've had that thought, right? You're like, wait, when's this going to end? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up here, okay? But listen, they are in heaven today worshiping God. speaking words of life to one another. I mean, I just look forward to that day when we get to reminisce about this day. Remember the time? Remember the time we, we launched this thing called Valley Simsbury? Remember all the struggles we went through? All the challenges, all the stupid decisions we made? <laughs> Remember God, how God was in all of it, that he had a plan for it? Remember the hard relationships we had? Some of the times the relationships sort of just had to, we had to go separate ways. But God was in it all. And we spoke honorably to one another. We spoke the words of heaven. We, we spoke peace towards one another. We are learning to be citizens of heaven here on earth. And maybe one thing that you would just evaluate this week is, is just to say, hey, how, how am I doing at being a citizen of heaven here on earth? How am I doing with my language? 
What's dominating my language? By the way, you read through the New Testament, you know what you see over and over again? Be thankful. Be thankful. Be thankful. Be thankful. You know what you hear from Paul when he's in prison? Be thankful. Be thankful. Rejoice always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Find something to rejoice about to your world because you will lift people and you will bring life into the world in the midst of brokenness. Now, I'm gonna give you one other phrase. I'm gonna go through this quick. I gotta cut out a bunch here, but um, here's another phrase. All things are possible. Only believe. All things are possible. Only believe. The first phrase referred to the posture of our heart towards people. This phrase refers to the posture of our heart towards problems. And the problem of life. All things are possible, I'm going to believe. I'm going to choose to believe that God's got something good here. Jesus himself, Luke chapter 18 says this, what is impossible for man is very possible with God. In Luke chapter 1, 37, the angel told Mary, nothing will be impossible for God. All things are possible. In Jeremiah 32, 17, uh, Jeremiah said, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth, and by your great power and by your outstretched arm, nothing is too difficult for you. In the midst of the brokenness and the hardships, and I can't see the future, and I don't know what God's doing, and I just, I, I, God, look, I need you to show up right now. These people were like, nothing's too impossible. All things are possible and will work towards God's perfect will. That doesn't mean that everything will be put together in like that wall in perfect shape in this world, but the day is coming where that will happen. And all things are possible. So in the brokenness of your life, in the problems of your life, I don't know what the problems are that you have in your life. Some of you have serious problems right now. Some of you, the wall has broken down this past year. And all I want to declare to you today is something that's spoken in heaven because they're in heaven and they're looking down on you and your circumstances. You know what they're saying? All things are possible. Nothing is too impossible for God. He will carry you through. And by the way, every problem comes with a promise and a provision. Every problem in your life has a promise and a provision as God is watching you and he's seeing what's going on in your life. And the question is, in the midst of the problems of your life, are you saying all oh, things are possible? God's got it. He's going to carry me through. I can tell you this, the, the, the world does not speak this language. A lot of people don't. Some people do. But they just, I guess, don't do it with God. And so there's not a whole lot of hope there. Uh, but what the language of heaven, what they know in heaven, is that God sees it all, and all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. The world is inherently negative. It's part of our flesh. It's part of what we got from Adam. And so most of us in our flesh uh, spend a decent amount of time complaining, critiquing, competing for our selfish good. In Christ, we become servants and we go about the world converting the negatives into positives. Uh, our lives are not dominated by the world around us, but with the kingdom within us. If you're in Christ, so are your circumstances. If you're in Christ, your circumstances have been brought into Christ also, and he is capable of doing whatever needs to be done to carry you through the circumstances. And so our, world, our words can't be flooded with pessimism, but should be flooded with possibility. All things are possible in this season of my life, in this stage of my life, wherever I am, God will carry me through. And there's a history that declares it and a future that has been declared. 
all things are possible because his, can't, his plan can't be thwarted. And so as we think about the words we speak, let's just review here a little bit today as we close. And I'll ask the worship team to come so we can start singing as soon as it's time. The words that we speak reveal the condition of our heart and the posture of our soul. The words that you speak are just telling us what's going on inside of you. And if you've lost faith and you're saying, I don't know if it's possible, it would be wise to immerse yourself in the word of God and the spirit of God and let him start to do a heart renovation in your heart that will result in a tongue that is speaking and singing a whole different song. Which, by the way, is what David says in Psalms 40 when uh, you too actually put it to, and I'm not going to try to sing it, but I waited patiently for the Lord, and he came and he heard my cry. He lifted me up. He picked me up out of the miry clay. And he put my feet on a rock. And those who see will know and fear the Lord. And that's, he put a new song in my heart. I missed that part of it. But that's what God does. He puts a new song in your soul, a new song in your mouth. And I would invite you to sing that song. I would invite you to sing the song of heaven. Because it's a glorious song for you and for everybody around you, amen.